Good afternoon. Happy Juneteenth. So I am a griot, a storyteller in the West African tradition and kind of do it my way because I am African American. But one of the things that is done in Africa is to honor, to remember the ancestors. It's not worshiping the ancestors. It is acknowledging that we didn't make ourselves. So I want to use these words by Alice Walker to open. To remember the ancestors means we are aware that we didn't make ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. We did not make ourselves. The line travels all the way back, perhaps to God or to God's. We remember them because it's easy to forget, easy to forget, easy to forget. We were not the first to suffer, rebel, fight, love, and die. The grace by which we live our lives, in spite of the pain and sorrows, is always a measure, always a measure, always a measure of what has gone before. Ashe by Alice Walker. I, I thought I'd begin with a tale from the motherland, and this one is about This one is about a rabbit and a lion and their village. This one is out of Botswana, Africa. So this is called The Thing Greater Than the Lion. Rabbit was mad, had an attitude. Lion had said that everybody had to come to his palace and bring food every Friday and bow before him and present the food to him. And Rabbit was like, who does he think he is? We are all equal in this village. Just because he's the king don't mean he got to treat us like nothing, bossing us around. He's supposed to look out for us. He's supposed to take care of us. I ain't doing it. But he knew if he did not bring the food, Lion would eat him. Lion had big teeth. Lion had big claws. Lion roared. Everyone in the village was afraid of him. But he thought, I am not giving that lion my food. I need that food for my children. And so he thought and thought, and he came up with a plan to trick the lion. When Friday came, all the, all the animals in the village lined up with their baskets of food. The giraffes had leafy leaves from the very tops of trees. And the turtle had fish that he had caught in the nearby pond. Everyone brought their favorite food and they brought it before the lion in a long line and bent down and presented it to the lion. But it was Rabbit's turn. He just stood there with his hand on his hip, looking all bored. And when it was her, his turn to step before the lion, he just stood there with attitude, swinging his head and letting his backbone slip. The lion said, where's my food? Why are you standing here empty-handed? You were supposed to give me food like everybody else. And the rabbit said, I'm not giving you my food. You ain't all that. The lion stood up and roared, Arr! what do you mean I'm not all that? I am king of this jungle. I rule the whole thing. And the rabbit said, I told you, you ain't all that. There is something greater than you. The lion said, greater than me? There is nothing greater than me. I am king. You bring that thing that thinks it's greater than me right before me, and I will eat it up. 
and then I'm going to eat you too. And the rabbit did not look concerned. He said, oh, brother, you are not greater than the thing that is greater than you. It's not afraid of you. And I'm not bringing it here. It's greater than you. You got to go see it. Ooh, the lion was mad. Rawr! Take me to it. Take me to it. Rawr! And the lion stood there waiting for the rabbit to say something. The rabbit finally said, oh, okay, you are really boring me. Follow me. And he led the lion through the jungle all the way back to a place that he had gotten ready for just this day. Back in the edges of the jungle was a tall hut and it had a door that was locked on it. And the rabbit said to the lion, the thing that is greater than you is inside that hut. And the rabbit said, you're going to have to go in there to see it. The lion said, no, you bring it out here to me. I am king of the jungle. Um, I don't think so, said the rabbit. You go in there. And he unlocked the door. The lion stepped into the hut. And the minute he was in there, the rabbit hopped behind him, slammed the door, and locked it again. The lion heard the door locked, and he started trying to get out. Boom, 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 knocking at the door. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. You've locked me in here. And the rabbit said, I'm not going to let you out until you see the thing that is greater than you. The lion looked around inside the hut and said, there is no one in here but me. No one is in here. Let me out, rabbit, and I promise I will eat you quick so it doesn't hurt too much. The rabbit said, I'm not letting you out, Mr. Lion, until you see the thing that is greater than you. Tell you what, I am going to go home and get something to eat, and I'll be back tonight. The lion roared. Arr! He was so angry. Let me out. Boom, 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 boom. He knocked at the door. He started jumping to try to get out of the ceiling, but it was too tall, too far away. He started scraping at the ground to dig his way out, but it was made of concrete, and he broke his nails. And so he was stuck inside. The rabbit, he went home to his family and ate his carrots and cabbage and good food that he had kept for his family. And when it got late, he went back to the hut. He hopped up to the door and he leaned in and he said, <laughs> uh, rabbit, are you in there? Lion, lion, are you inside there? And the lions roared, Argh! of course I'm in here, you locked me in here, let me out. And the rabbit said, have you seen the thing greater than you? And the lion said, there's no one in here but me. Let me out and maybe I will let you live. Let me out. And he started banging on the door again. But the rabbit said, lion, until you see the thing that's greater than you. I can't let you out. I'll come back in a couple of days. And the rabbit hopped away. The lion went crazy. He started jumping again, trying to get out the ceiling, scraping at the floor, banging boom, 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 on the door. But he couldn't get out. A day went by. A second day went by. A third day came by. And that night, the rabbit went back to the hut. He went over to the door and he said, Lion, <laughs> Lion, are you still in there? And there was silence. The lion didn't say anything. He leaned over again and listened. He heard no sound. He said, Lion, are you inside there? But the lion didn't say anything. And the rabbit took his key and unlocked the door and went inside. The lion was laying on the floor of the, of the hut, breathing hard. <sighs> he was hungry and so weak, and he said to the rabbit, please, do you have something to eat? I'm thirsty, I'm hungry. And the rabbit pulled an orange out of his pocket and gave it to the lion. The lion ate the orange, peels and all. He was so hungry. He said, another please. And the rabbit gave him another one. 
And the rabbi said, ah, so you have met the thing that is greater than you. And the lion started crying. <laughs> There's no one in here but me. What are you talking about? And the rabbi said, hunger is greater than the lion. We all get hungry, big and small. We all get hungry and need food. No one is better than the other. And he helped the lion up off the floor. The lion said, you're right. I have been treating everyone so badly. We are all equal. I am not a good leader. I am so sorry. And he and the rabbit walked all the way back out of the jungle to the village. Once he was there, the lion called everyone to come to his palace. And he stood up and he said, every Friday you will bring me a basket of food. The rabbit was like, what? He didn't learn anything? He didn't learn anything from this? And then the lion said, we will gather together like you see at this Juneteenth festival. We will share our food and even I will bring a basket to share. And every Friday, we will be a community because no one is greater than the other. And the rabbit smiled because the lion had learned there was something greater than he. The thing greater than the lion, a Botswana tale from Africa. Thank you. So we're here to celebrate our heritage, which began in Africa, that we carried over with us these tales and stories uh, from at the motherland to this world in America when we were enslaved. And, and we are not always taught in school our resistance to slavery. We are kind of taught that we just accepted this station in life, that we didn't fight it. But right in Syracuse, New York, there was an underground railroad station run by Reverend Jermaine Logan of the AME Giant Zion Church. He and Harriet Tubman from Auburn had started the first AME Zion Church in Syracuse. And during the Underground Railroad period before the Civil War, Reverend Logan ran his house on East Genesee Street and Pine Street as an Underground Railroad station. We know some of the stories of the happening of the house because his daughter, Sarah, told her daughter about what went on in this Underground Railroad station. And her daughter wrote those stories down. It's in a book that's never been published. If you go to Howard University Library in Washington, DC, our vice president's alma mater, you can read The Underground Railroad Princess. It's typed up in places, it's handwritten, there are uh, scribbles and marks. You can see the original manuscript. And here's a story of what went on in the Underground Railroad station at the corner of Pine and East Genesee Street in Syracuse, New York. Two, two, two. Two, two, two. That was the secret signal one short, two long whistles from the train. Two short, one long whistles from the train. Three whistles. The combination didn't matter. The order didn't matter. It was always three. And no matter what we were doing in our house, we stopped. And it was my job as a little girl to go get blankets. And I give them to my father and to my mother and this runaway, this freedom seeker who ran from the South and didn't stop along the way but anywhere but our house and decided to stay. He didn't go on to Canada. Henry was his name, Henry Kelso. So I give the blankets to my mother and father and Henry Kelso and they would leave out the back door of our house in the night. They would walk silently down the hill of Pine Street to the Erie Canal. 
And along the canal, there was a street called Washington Street. And they would turn right, they turn east. And they walked down a couple blocks and there was a tunnel there, a train tunnel. And once inside that tunnel, trains would slow down and they'd give their signal, toot, toot, toot. And freedom takers, those who ran out of slavery, would jump into my mother and father's and Henry's arms. They'd wrap them with those blankets I gave them to hide their faces in the summertime because what we were doing was illegal. It was illegal to help those who were enslaved get to freedom. They'd wrap them in those blankets in the wintertime because they would be wearing rags that barely, barely covered their bodies. Sometimes their feet would be wrapped in rags that they were bleeding in the snow with. And they'd walk them back up to our house, sneak them in the side door. Once inside, we'd feed them because they'd be so hungry. And we'd give them new clothing that the community had gathered, those who knew what we were doing because we were a secret house and we would give them new clothing to wear. And we would heal them if we could. One time, Auntie Harriet, you know her, Harriet Tubman? Harriet Tubman used to use our house. She brought six adults and three children with her. And one of the children had gunshots in their arm and leg, and I helped my mother dig them out, sew that his body back together. We'd feed and clothe them, and heal them if we could. And then we would take them upstairs to a room right down the hall from my room, a room with no windows, a room we call the fugitive chamber, a secret room. And people would stay for a week, a night. One family stayed a whole month and we got to pay, play with the children. Jump roping and talking and the talking was the hardest because then the children would tell us stories about what it was like to be in slavery. And I hated hearing those stories. They were so awful. The families would stay with us a night or two and then they would be led on by another person on the Underground Railroad, another conductor. Sometimes we ourselves would put them on trains that were heading east to Niagara Falls, where they would be put on boats going over the water. Those trains that gave the secret signal were people who agreed not to turn in runaways. See, the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 said that it was illegal to help enslaved people get to freedom. That you could go to jail for six months per person you helped that you would be fined $1,000 per person. That's $20,000 in our money today. That they could confiscate your land, your business, your personal goods if you could not pay the fine. And so what we did was a secret. So there was this man in Syracuse, Mr. White, who owned railroads who would give us tickets and we would use them to get people to freedom. Sometimes we put them on the northern route going to Oswego, and then they would catch boats into Canada. And sometimes they would just leave our house in hidden compartments and, and, and carts. And then someone would be led walking onto Frederick Douglass house and to other places where people would help them. Now our mother said, you can tell anybody about my family. My mother was born a free black woman in New York State. But my father, she said, don't you talk about him. Don't say anything about him. Because my father had run from slavery himself. And if he was caught, he would be returned to slavery. We would never see our daddy again. She said, if anybody asks about him, ask what, which way they're going. Remember what they were wearing, what they said, and come back and tell me. But you don't talk about your father. And we kept the secret of what was going on in our house, this illegal activity on the Underground Railroad in Syracuse, New York. Thank you.
1829, Harriet Powell came to Syracuse, New York. She was a young lady, very light skin, straight hair. She looked like she was a servant of the Davenport family. And little did people know at first in Syracuse that she was enslaved. When people learned that she was enslaved, it was through the black workers in the hotel that the Davenports were staying in. And so they asked her, you know, how is it to work for these people? And they found out she was their slave. And they said, we in Syracuse can get you free if you want to be free. And Harriet Powell said, no, no, I will not run away from slavery. And they asked, why? Why wouldn't you want to be free? And the, she said, the Davenports own my mother and father. And if I run away, they will punish them for what I do. I cannot run. But then the people in Syracuse, the abolitionists there, found out that her master, Mr. Davenport, was going to sell her. And they went and told her again, you will never be free. He's going to sell you. Let us help you run. And she decided that she would try for her freedom. One night when the Davenports were giving a party in the hotel, Harriet snuck out of the building to a waiting carriage. She had already thrown her possessions, the little bit that she owned, out the back window where they had caught it and put it in the carriage. They drove her around and around, and then drove her out of Syracuse, New York, to Garrett Smith's home, and a, 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 a big, rich abolitionist that used his fortune to help people get out of slavery. There she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a teenager at the time. Garrett Smith was her uncle, and she sat up all night talking and learning about slavery from Harriet Powell. And that's where Elizabeth Cady Stanton decided to dedicate her life to helping get people free from slavery. She was finally got, she finally got to Canada with the help of abolitionists along the route going north to freedom. And she ended up in a, hiding in a home there of abolitionists. But she wasn't safe. We think that when those who were enslaved got to Canada, they were safe. They weren't. They had bounties on their head. She had a bounty on her head. And Canadians often would re return people to slavery. They would tell on them. They would capture them. And they would get the money. And Davenport was not going to let her go. He kept sending bounty hunters up into Canada looking for her as he found out she was free. And the family that she was staying with in Canada hid her in the attic over and over and over again. Davenport tried to find her for over a year. And he finally went broke, which was one of the reasons he was going to sell her for money. And she was finally free. Harriet Powell is buried in a Kingston, Ontario cemetery. She ended up getting married and having 12 children. Ow! And she lived out her life as a free woman. The story of Harriet Powell in 1829. Thank you. I thought I would do one or two stories. I think they've got time. I'll fill some time about the civil rights movement because we've been fighting for our freedom for a long time in the United States and that fight is not over. We have a wonderful community here in Auburn, people of all color and ages. But we know that we have to always be vigilant about freedom in our country and making sure that everyone is free. So I thought I'd tell the story of Cheyenne Webb who was eight years old and marched with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So let me pretend that I am Cheyenne Webb. I was late to school, and I was gonna be in a lot of trouble. See, our principal did not play around. If you were late, she would meet you at the door, and she would not let you in without talking to you, and then calling your parents. 
So I was late that morning, and my friend and I, who always walk together, ran towards the school, trying to make it in before the door closed and before the principal was standing there. And as we were running down the street past our church, we noticed all these black cars pulled up, and men, ministers, began to get out of them. And I swear to God, I swear to God, believe me, one of them was Dr. Martin Luther King. He had come to Selma, Alabama to organize marches and sit-ins. Well, we didn't care about being to school on time at that point. We had to go see Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so me and my friend, we snuck up the stairs of the church and ducked down behind the back pew. And Martin Luther King and these other ministers were talking about organizing marches in Selma, Alabama. And we must have coughed or something, but he looked up and he looked straight at where we were hiding. And he said, young ladies, what are you doing back there? <clears throat> and me and my friend, we poked our head over the top of the pew. And he said, young ladies, come up here. Come up here with, 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 with me. And he said, do you know who I am? And I said, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I started jumping up and down. I was so excited. And he laughed. He said, aren't you supposed to be in school? And she said, yeah, but I saw you come in the church and I had to be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, I am going to have a big meeting at this church on Sunday. I want you to be there and your friend to be there, Cheyenne. And Cheyenne Webb said, I will be there. I am coming. Now go on to school, he said. And me and my friend, we ran down the block to school. Well, the principal was standing there waiting, tapping her foot. And she said, young ladies, why are you late to school? And I said, we saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And she said, stop lying. No, no, he's at the church. He's going to have a meeting Sunday. And she said, really? Go, go on into school, go on to your class. And I went to class. And then later, while I was in the class, another teacher came to the door and called my teacher out. And they were whispering, and they kept looking at me. And I knew they were talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, at lunchtime, the cafeteria ladies were all over me. They wanted to know everything I saw, everything I heard. And by the time I got home, someone had called my mother and told her, that I had seen Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, Alabama. And I said to her, Mama, Mama, he wants me to go to the meeting Sunday. He wants me to march in the marches. And she said, absolutely not. You are eight years old. You are too young to mar march with Dr. Martin Luther King. It is very dangerous. I said, Mama, but I want to help make change. I want to help change things. No. And when my father came home, he said no. And if you march, you, we could lose our jobs. We could lose our home. No, you cannot march with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But when Sunday came and it was time for the meeting, I went to my window, I opened my window, and I stepped out and ran down to the church. There were people outside and the church was crowded and I pushed my way through. And I was in the middle aisle when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. looked up and he saw me and he said, Cheyenne Webb, come on up here with me. And everybody turned to look at me. The church was silent as I walked up front. I felt so uncomfortable and he stood had me stand right next to him as he talked about the marches that were coming to Selma, Alabama. Boy, when I got home, my mother and father were mad. I got a whooping and I got grounded. And I was told you will never go to another meeting and certainly you are not marching in any march with my, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. No. But the next meeting came And I snuck out the window again. I skipped school and went to meetings. I went to every meeting at the church 
Every time my parents punished me, but I kept going and they finally gave up, we can't stop you. And I became a part of the movement until a young civil rights mur worker was murdered in Selma. And we decided to do a march from Selma to Montgomery, to the capital of Alabama. My parents told me, no, you cannot go on this march. It will take three days or more. No. But it, when, when it was time for the march, I was there. We gathered together on our side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and we kneeled down and prayed before we started our march. And we started marching up over the hill that was the bridge. The bridge went up into the air and then down the other side. And when we got to the top of the bridge, the top of the incline, in front of us was a sea of men Every white male from 21 years old and upward had been deputized. They had bats, they had sticks, some were on horses, they had dogs, they had tear gas. And when we reached the top of that bridge, they started coming for us. I was so scared. I knelt down to pray like we had prayed as I saw people being beat down, run over by horses. There were also people there with cameras, a lot of news people had come to document this march and they were taking pictures. And I knelt there praying, I was praying to God that I'd survive this when this man came running by and he picked me up and started running with me. And I said to him, you are going too slow, put me down, put me down. And he put me down and I ran all the way back home. My parents said, this is what we told you about. You are too little, you are eight years old. In the coming weeks, there was another march where Dr. Martin Luther King came and we marched to the top of the Edmund Pettus Bridge and we knelt, knelt and prayed. Over 3,000 people came to Montgomery, Alabama, to Selma, Alabama from all over the world for the final march all the way from Montgomery and I was in that march. My father came driving by in a car, and I thought, oh no, come on, daddy, and he made me get in the car. But instead of taking me home, he took me to the state capitol in Montgomery, and we waited for the marchers. I, it was there that I witnessed Martin Luther King say, how long will it take us to realize the promise of justice in this society, how long? But things changed a little after that. The 1964 Voter Right Act was passed that was greatly influenced by this march, by all the marches on the Edmund Pattis Bridge. And I asked my parents to register to vote for the very first time in their lives. It felt so good after the last march. It was like we were having fun. We had reached the point that we were fighting for for a long, long time. And if you were to stand in the midst of the thousands and thousands of people and all the great leaders and political people who had come from all over the world, I asked my mother and father for my birthday present to become registered voters. They took me with to, they took me to the polls with them to vote. And it was very exciting. And the thing that was so unique well, to me was the fact that it was something so simple, just a mark on a ballot. I thought it would be such a long drawn out thing because of how people had to fight. But it was only the matter of walking into a building and making our marks. It was exciting, it was exciting to them, it was exciting for me to see. And I'll never forget it, my parents voted, my parents voted and made history. 
after all of the marching and all of the beatings and all of the tear gas and all of the dying, it was simple. Cheyenne Webb, eight years old, one of the youngest freedom fighters during the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you for having me at this June 2.